Hello, welcome to uh, Thames Valley Chamber Quarter Four, uh, Quarterly Economic Survey Output Event. Um, I'm here joined today by uh, Claire Hawthorne from BDO and Carol LePage also from uh, BDO. And we're here at the studios of the Berkshire Channel. And we've got Faisal Majidjeen, who is the owner and proprietor, who will be joining us during our, today's conversation. Quarterly economic survey, we have to remember, is a sentiment survey. So when I ring up and ask you all for um, how your business is doing, remember I ask for no numbers. It's very much an important aspect of the survey because it's, it's, it's alive, it's a business sentiment, so that we understand how your businesses are doing today. Who uses this survey output? Well, the Chamber uses it as a lobbying perspective when we go and tap on the door in Downing Street to explain how we're using, how business is doing. But also Bank of England use it when they do interest rate setting. Clearly they have lots of other m markers and margins and markers and measures and goodness knows what but they use it for that purposes as well. The survey of the Thames Valley is, in this instance, uh, runs geographically from, if you like, uh, from Slough in the east up through Buckinghamshire, uh, covers of Oxfordshire down to Swindon in the west, and then we run up the M4 all the way through Newbury and Reading and back to, to Slough in the east again. So that's the geographic spread of businesses taking part in this survey. Yes, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, uh, BDO, for helping us with the, the survey, because without, without them and all our members, uh, this would not be possible. So I ask you, uh, why are we doing it this way uh, today, which is a, a recording? We've done lots of different methods, haven't we? You, those of you who have regularly joined me uh, for Zoom meetings, and the last session uh, was a, a live uh, event in the offices of BDO in Reading. Well, we just thought we'd be different today. It's January. We want you to take some time to perhaps listen to, through to some of the comments that, that you're here in, in, in this session. And, and obviously we like to reach out. We need to embrace different ways that we, we reach out to our members and you. Um, live events we love, don't we? But let's, let's talk about what we're here doing today and it gives you the opportunity to listen in and watch when it's good for you. To begin today, let me introduce you now to David Barrier, who is the Head of Research at the British Chamber of Commerce, who will now present you with the national picture uh, from our quarterly economic survey. David, over to you. Hi everyone, pleasure to be here for today's event with Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce and BDO. My name is David Barrier, I'm Head of Research at the British Chambers of Commerce, and today I'll give a brief overview of some of the key headline findings from our most recent national quarterly economic survey. The quarterly economic survey is the UK's largest and longest running private sector business survey. It was established in 1989 and is used extensively by the media, Bank of England when setting monetary policy, and the government when looking at business policy. And it's a really powerful tool for looking at broad economic trends in the UK. Most recent quarters have shown us that Business conditions have, de have declined quite seriously in the second half of 2022, with a significant amount of headwinds mounting up for businesses in general. So if we look at what's occurred in the last six months, we've had unprecedented inflationary pressures, widespread skill shortages, very, very high energy costs. We've had bouts of political uncertainty. And of course, now we're looking at strikes, tax rises, and of course, trade barriers. What I'll do is just highlight some of this in about four key stats. The first is looking at business activity. And what we see here when looking at the percentage of firms reporting increased sales is that that's gone down over the last two or three quarters quite significantly. So overall, only 33% of businesses report increased domestic sales, whereas 25% have reported a decrease. Within sectors like retail, wholesale and hospitality, the picture is even worse and has been for the last six months. I also mentioned labour market tightness and our survey demonstrates very clear tightness in the labour market. Over 82% of businesses this quarter reported that they weren't able to access the right staff that they needed. They faced difficulties recruiting the staff. And this is basically the highest on record. And again, we see some sectoral divergences emerge here. 87% of 
of businesses in the hospitality sector report recruitment difficulties. What impact is that having is that they're having to reduce capacity. So what we see now is a record number of hospitality firms in particular reporting that they're operating below full capacity. And we see this theme quite often. Uh, so here's a quote from a business in Sussex, small service firm. They say that they could increase their business by about 20% if they could find the right people. So it's really a uh, material concern for many businesses. The other major factor that we've seen recently, of course, in the last year and a half is inflation. Now, inflation is by far and away the top concern for businesses, and it, and it continues to be the top concern in the most recent results. 80% of firms overall cite this as a concern to their business, and that's unprecedented. Uh, we see that drivers of inflation are primarily on the energy cost side, but also on the labor cost side. Manufacturers are more likely to report that raw materials have been driving costs. If, again, we look at some examples of this, we have a small service sector firm in Somerset talking about their electricity bills rising from £34,000 per year to £250,000. Really unprecedented shocks to the amount that they have to spend on, on gas and electricity. We have another manufacturer in the East Midlands talking about raw material costs going up by 405%. Again, really unprecedented. We haven't seen this before. So what's all of this doing is... Uh, to, uh, reducing long-term confidence. And arguably, this is probably the most worrying statistic. When we look at the proportion of businesses looking to increase their profitability in the next 12 months, actually, we're seeing record lows here. And we have been seeing a tailing off of this particular data set in the last two or three quarters. Now, most uh, more firms expect a decrease in their profitability than an increase. And this is basically at its lowest level since the height of the COVID crisis. So this is quite worrying, but it, it's quite predictable when you consider the collision of all of these crises. So what happens next? Well, I think the results continue to suggest that a recession is more likely in, throughout 2023. And indeed, we're forecasting uh, around five consecutive quarters of recession across 2023. And this is as a result of multiple crises converging. However, there could be some tailwinds that emerge um, if key geopolitical crises, such as the Ukraine conflict or lockdowns in China, see some resolution. That could help build a more um, stable environment for investment. But of course, a lot of this now depends on the domestic investment environment. Business taxation is going up that's more of a concern for businesses. So we may see inflation start to give way to other crises. So what should the government look at? Well, again, the data is very clear. Uh, skills shortages and inflation are the top issues affecting businesses. So on skills shortages, there needs to be a programme of reduction of barriers for inactive workers to re-enter or enter into the workforce. So there could be some technical changes made to things like pensions, but also investigation of longer term issues like uh, long term sickness, how uh, people who uh, uh, fall into that category can be reintegrated into the workforce. There needs to be action on energy costs. So following the recent Skidmore review, there needs to be direct funding and advice for businesses to support on energy saving and renewable energy. And then finally, International trade is still a major issue for a lot of businesses. We saw uh, a quite a big shock transitioning to the new Brexit arrangement, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So there definitely needs to be some stabilisation to this and some more certainty around the future of the agreement, particularly on the Northern Ireland Protocol, but also on supplementary deals for things like VAT and food exports. And for businesses, um, there's some obvious things that, that could be achieved here, um, looking at reviewing recruitment plans and other workplace policies to uh, try and bring new people into the business. Uh, so you could take advantage of the apprenticeship levy, which can provide a 95% discount on apprenticeship training, and also engage with the local skills improvement plans that are being run by chambers to try and integrate you as a business into 
uh, the the widest skills making uh, skills policy making apparatus. And I know that BDO will touch on this further. Secondly, make sure you're taking advantage of tax release on investments. So you can go on the government website um, uh, around tax release for corporation tax, for example. And also consider in-kind relationships with other firms to look at ways of reducing costs. Maybe there's a mutually beneficial arrangement to, to put in place where uh, you can provide marketing or shared office space. There could be a, an opportunity around that. And then finally, I would always urge businesses to speak with their local chamber of commerce for support. Uh, there's always businesses going through the same sort of challenges uh, that has been laid out by these results. It's always worth talking to those businesses to, to learn and get best practice. Get your views heard and help shape policy providing by providing evidence to chambers through these sort of surveys, uh, the quarterly economic survey, but also the British Chambers of Commerce uh, program of surveys across the year around workforce conditions, trade. We really appreciate your time on these because this is what forms the basis of the evidence that government need to help shape policy. So it's absolutely essential that you take part. And, and finally, I'll just say uh, thank you again for taking part in this. And uh, hopefully the results will be quite useful to you. Thank you. So thank you to uh, to David for that uh, brief overview of the uh, quarterly economic survey. I hope I've got that right, uh, yeah. Tim. Yeah, that's, no, that's spot on. That's fantastic. So Claire, you're going to talk to us a little bit now, I believe, about the quarterly economic survey and the impact within the Thames Valley, certainly for our members. Yes, yes. The floor is yours, Claire. So away you go. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. And um, similar to what, what David's just covered, the, the results have largely stabilised this quarter, which was positive to see. And I think the Thames Valley in general is is seeing more of, of an uptick and a more positive outlook than perhaps across the national survey. So I've broken this down into three areas. We're going to look at sales, staff and cash flow and investment. And I thought I'd give a few kind of takeaways for things businesses to be thinking about. So starting with sales, um, we're seeing more businesses have seen a decrease in UK sales this quarter, which was interesting. It was up to 22% from 14% last quarter and 10% the previous quarter. So it's been a steady increase of businesses seeing a decrease in sales. And the position on overseas sales has largely remained consistent with around 60% of businesses seeing those overseas sales remaining consistent. Looking at staffing, and, and staffing has been a key topic all throughout um, 2022, and I imagine is going to continue to be a key area of focus for 2023, as ultimately staff are key to any business. Without staff, you don't have a business. So... And uh, so what are we seeing in the Thames Valley around staffing? So 43% of businesses are expecting their workforce to increase moving forward into 2023. So uh, as we're seeing that businesses are continuing to want to recruit staff, and that is largely um, permanent full-time staff as well. There's been a reduction in the number of businesses attempting to recruit staff, though in the last quarter, that was down to 63% from 71%. But hopefully that's actually a positive in that people have been able to recruit staff. So there aren't as many businesses actively looking and this, this war for talent is, is perhaps slowing down slightly. And we're transitioning from that candidate-led market more it back into a normal kind of stable place there. 80% of businesses, though, did report that they are continuing to have difficulty in recruiting staff. So although that has remained at a fairly consistent level, I think with some of the results in, in the number of businesses um, attempting to recruit staff um, has reduced down, that 80% are still having difficulty. Is that because we're filling some vacancies? Is that because businesses perhaps have looked at their current pool and reassigned staff in what they're doing or perhaps come up with alternative ways to to fill those gaps that they've got. Finally moving on to cash flow and investment. So again there's been a slight decline on businesses seeing an increase in their cash flow so it's down to 34% from 38% 
and investment plans have remained fairly consistent. So limited plans to reinvest and we all know cash is king so so keeping a close eye on that and that's largely around plant and machinery space fixed assets and training and development of staff there has however been an increase in confidence with 63 percent of businesses believing turnover will improve going forward so that's great that there there's been an increase there and that's up from 58 percent so a reasonable jump in in that quarter and corresponding to that 44 percent of businesses have reported that they're going to see an increase in profitability so that's interesting that businesses are are both tracking that sales and profitability are going to increase moving forward. There's been pressure to continue to drive up prices. Um, All we see in the media at the moment is cost of living crisis, how all costs are increasing, constant rate of inflation increasing, and that businesses are reporting that interest rates are becoming more of a concern so rising interest rates and that's up to to 45% of businesses saying that's a concern but inflation remains the largest concern for businesses in terms of looking at how that's going to impact them and their pricing strategies going forward however that that did peak last quarter you know we were almost at 90 percent reporting that inflation is is a real concern to them and that has dropped to 73 so that that term of kind of stability and stabilizing we we are seeing that a bit more this quarter the other areas that continue to be a pressure on prices is increased staff costs this war for talent that we mentioned earlier and also utilities so increased gas and electric costs that whilst we have the government support at the moment, we still don't know the position on what's going to happen in April time. So that's continuing to to kind of sit in the back of, of entrepreneurs' minds, I'm sure. So looking at, at those three areas and, and some key takeaways for businesses, what, what can they think about? What can they, they do? Firstly, on, on your sales, it's what is your sales mix as a business how many different sales lines do you have do you track those lines individually are you aware if you have unprofitable lines and what is your pricing strategy around that secondly on staff what is your need for more staff have you looked into the pool of staff you've got and perhaps investing a bit more in training and development of your existing staff could you redeploy some individuals and and utilize other skills to help with that need for for additional resource Um, also looking at things like your remuneration strategy which I'm sure Carol will touch on a bit later about how you incentivize and attract staff to your business and finally outsourcing do you need to keep everything in-house that you do? And actually, is there a more cost-effective way you could get this completed by outsourcing it to a third-party provider? You then don't have to worry about the employment of those staff, the um, appraisal process and, and all the on costs that come with that. Finally, on cash flow and investment going forward, the key here is planning. Have you got a cash flow forecast in place for your business? Linking back to that sales mix piece, do you know what your break-even point is? How much revenue do you have to generate each month to break even? And what then you can look at sensitivities around that. So what impact would it have if you actually stripped out an unprofitable sales line? Or post-April, if your energy costs increased 25%, What impact does it have on your break even, on your cash flow going forward? And with all of this, I would say talk to your advisors. Don't just sit there and worry about it and think I'm the only one that's having these difficulties. I'm the only one that's having these troubles. Talk to people around you because they will be able to support you. They will have ideas and they probably will challenge you on what you're saying but in a good way, just to get you to think perhaps a bit broader and a bit differently about things. 
So hopefully that's been useful and given some pointers of things for businesses to think about moving forward. I know we're all very busy, so hopefully it's just a couple of key points there and look forward to seeing what the next quarter says, hopefully some more stabilisation or improvement even further. Well, Claire, well, that was a lot to uh, to take in. So thanks for that. And we've got some, I think we've got some uh, interesting people around the table. So I'd love to maybe just pick a few points and uh, maybe bring them out for discussion. Um, you talked about sales, staff and cash flows, probably the three most important elements that most of us are too busy to think about in reality. So, I mean, <clears throat> that's the first thing maybe I'd like to maybe ask Tim, maybe Carol, maybe Claire, you have a view yourself. I, I think of myself, and I'm so busy during the day, operationally managing, and I could even say firefighting quite often. And I, I sometimes think to myself, the only time I've got to think about this is when I'm at home, which is the worst thing you do, especially if you have a home life like I do. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts in terms of how we can maybe or how I could bring this to the front of my mind and make this more of a priority, making time? I mean, maybe it's a time management thing. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting point. And actually, it's giving yourself permission to take that time because actually it's going to give you more time in the long run. If you invest half a day, perhaps, looking at your strategy, looking at your sales mix, looking at how you price things, then you're you're coming up with a more a standardised format, perhaps, and you're not trying to be all things to all people and actually, then you save time in the future. Sure. So it's it's a hard one to kind of take. Yeah. But but I would suggest to all kind of management teams or perhaps business owners, take yourself out of the business. Go go somewhere different for the day. Give yourself or, or half a day or whatever, you know, give yourself that time to really focus. Because if you're focused on it, you'll you'll probably be quite efficient and get through it relatively quickly. I, I suppose so. And I think that's a really good call, isn't it? Because I've often do, done that. And I guess it's planning and yeah. saying, right, half an hour, you know, next month on this particular day, I'm going away for half a day. And you probably, know, you know, I know my business better than anybody else does. So I guess we're in the best position to do that. So I guess that's a real good takeaway. Yeah, well, Tim. I guess we all, we all work too long <coughs> um, in our business rather than on it. And I think that's perhaps the time. And sometimes when people come along to uh, chamber events, I say to them, just come back come out of your business for a moment and talk to other people in the room to understand what their challenges are and and what they're doing well because actually you can pick out little bits that actually you can bring into your day-to-day uh, work I, I certainly do um, it, it, even if it's just a, a fraction so it's a constant need as to a change and adapt fantastic and just maybe as a closing point for this particular part of the program What's your sort of outlook? What's your feeling for the Thames Valley? I'm a member of the, the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I'm sure there's a lot more members out here watching this, I hope. We I hope. hope so yeah. um, so what's your sort of feeling? What, what, you know, should we be feeling good about this year, 2023, based on what the results are telling us? I think the results are, are certainly telling us that people's mindset is changing. There, sure. there is a bit more positivity in, in the marketplace. It's still a very challenging time. There's lots of unknowns. So I think it's it's plan. The more you plan, you're going to prepare to succeed and, and talk to people. I think Tim's, Tim's point he makes then was excellent, that talk to other people who will perhaps, where you're so involved in the business, who can perhaps just put that probing question in and you think, do you know what? Actually, I hadn't, hadn't thought about that, but that's actually going to have quite a big impact if I do something. Yeah, and sometimes actually just the, a plan could be, um, we'll talk about the Business Voice magazine later, um, but actually y- use the results of other people's comments and thoughts because these are actually the what your customers are telling you in the survey. So it's actually use that information to think ahead and plan for your business. Fantastic. And just very quickly, where as a member can we get access to this particular information, this report? Where, where can we get access to it? I guess that's me, isn't it really? Is um, that you? Yeah. Tim, so basically what we do is that you can see um, in the Business Voice magazine current edition, you will see the quarter three right. um, results. Um, then we'll be publishing um, 
today as you listen to this uh, video you'll be, you'll be able to see the Thames Valley results and then when we do the Business Voice magazine um, for the next quarter um, you will see them all over again so there's lots of opportunity uh, to actually read the results but also I, as I, I would suggest you just look back at um, um, and see what everyone's telling you. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks for that, uh, Claire. That was quite a uh, quite an insightful view uh, from the Thames Valley perspective, and hugely informative. And I guess people like us could take a lot more from that than we probably do already. Um, Carol, I don't know how you feel about uh, all of this and what we've been saying. Yeah, it's interesting. It's nice to see the Thames Valley doing well comparatively anyway with with the national picture um and i think the point about you know businesses really taking time is really important they they are effectively or, or you are your most important client if if you would take half a day to service an important client why don't you take half a day to give yourself the time to think um because ultimately it is about having the right strategy at the moment it's so important and it's about not really revenue but profitability um, and I thought it was very interesting, actually, that there was that uptick of 40 or percent of businesses in the Thames Valley thinking that profitability would also go up with revenue. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is at the moment when everyone's talking about cost pressures and so on and so on. So I thought that was a very interesting um, point that came out of the survey. Sure. It's, um, I mean, uh, one point from my perspective, and I think, um, Claire, well, both really, but Claire, something that you mentioned about sales, staff and cash flow. That's all, as a small business myself, that's always on my mind, probably subconsciously, I'd say. And um, if I look at myself, and, and you talk about sales mix, well, inadvertently, I think that's probably one of my key focuses. And I'd love to sort of hear your view on what, what my thoughts are, what I've been doing, because one thing for 2023 that I've made the decision for is to really look at my sales mix and think, what is my core offer? And by that, I mean, a, what do I know we do well? What do I feel we do well? Maybe what do clients tell us we do well? And only focus on the core business, on the core offer. In the past, what I've tried to do is sort of cast the net out to everything and everyone and, and try and be everything and everyone purely to get clients, but also to increase turnover. And But what I found, certainly in years gone by, that the effort, the stress, the pressure of trying to be something that you're not actually is huge. And with that, the added costs of saying, well, we can't do that in-house, so let's just pay someone to do that outside. But of course, you don't plan for that. And suddenly that's a cost later on. You think, wow, we didn't make as much profit as I thought we did. And I guess the weird thing, which I'm sure you'll have a view on, is I've decided to almost pick the clients that are probably the best for us that we can absolutely deliver the right service for and then not worry. Because I know we're fairly confident that we can do the job. The clients will be happy that we can do it. The service offers perhaps a little bit smaller. Turnover is perhaps a little bit less in this respect. But what I found is that actually I feel a lot happier with the service that we can deliver and with, with happiness and lower stress levels, you can go out and grow. Whereas before I found myself constantly thinking, is that client happy? Is that client happy? Why would they be happy if it's not our core offer? But I don't know. I mean, is it the right way to look at it to think, can we be selective about who we choose to provide a service to? Because before it was the other way around, wasn't it? We had to make ourselves the most attractive to uh, to get clients to pick us but it's almost the other way around I, I don't know does that does that sound weird Carol I don't know no I think it's very sensible actually because it is all about client service and if you're trying to do something that is slightly outside of your area of expertise it's naturally going to be harder um, so if you're able to focus on what is truly core you're going to do it better your clients are going to get a better experience and want to come back which will help with the growth anyway um, and it should actually give you the bandwidth as well to be able to think about changes to the business and, and you know, are you actually kind of employing the right strategy as well? Yeah. Um, all of which you would hope would come through to profitability, which is, is the most fundamental point. Profitability has become a bigger point now, and you talked about utilities. I mean, I, I did, I'm quite lucky I, I work in a serviced office, and I know they're being quite conscious, but a couple of friends I've got who don't have that privilege, their electricity bills and gas bills are just going through the roof 
Yeah, and I think on that point you were making, Faisal, about the looking at your sales mix, it's interesting for businesses also if you're ultimately planning an exit to to realise the value of your business. If the business is so attached to you as an individual, there's nothing there to sell if you're wanting to exit the business. Whereas if you can standardise as much as possible and remove as much attachment from you as an individual to you as the business that helps ultimately with that exit strategy and realization of value Uh, and that's been on my mind not that we're going to sell anything but but that then leads to your second point which is staffing Mm -hmm. and as long as you've got somebody again the challenge we're quite lucky we found a great team it took a while to get there a lot of mistakes as well a lot of cost to get there as well but finding someone that you can actually trust enough to delegate to do the right job my biggest weakness before was I'll just do everything myself and that's I think what wore me down and wore me down and you know only later do you think if you can invest time in other people to trust them to do it but you know easy to say but probably one of the biggest challenges I'd say to do and as a small business owner and I'm sure I'm not alone in saying it's quicker for me to just do it myself no, definitely, you're you're not alone. It's it's a control thing, and we're we're humans, right? We're people pleasers. So, sure, um, it's it's all about that trust point again, and and kind of you might spend more time initially training and developing someone, but that's only going to help you grow more in the future because you can then place your focus elsewhere. Sure. Um, you mentioned a point on international business as well. So, um, and I think you were saying that international business is growing or certainly business with international partners is growing as well. Yes. Yeah, so that, that the results on that had kind of largely stabilised. So it's, it's still there. It's, it's growing a small amount, but it's largely remaining consistent. So there is still a lot of international trade. Yeah, I've, I found that myself. We do a lot of international work as well. And I think you're right. It seems to be stabilising. They seem to be um, quite consistent with what they need in other countries, which you know, makes life a lot easier. So I can totally see how that, uh, how that can work. Tim, any views from your perspective? It's quite interesting on the uh, overseas uh, sort of international trade perspective. I was talking to uh, a member yesterday who was saying that their regular overseas uh, customers coming to see them tomorrow and they were over preparing. And he was saying that actually they arrived, and this is probably the difficult part for when we're, we're trading overseas, that they actually will come and see him and they expect uh, certain costs at certain percentages um, to be on the table when they arrive. So if they think that inflation is at, at 5%, obviously there's a bit of a challenge, isn't there, right now to explain to them that it really isn't because they are basing their actual deal size and how much they're going to pay for the good um, on a historical uh, uh, rate of, of inflation. So those challenges, so there's that cross-border um, in, interpretation of what's going on in the, in the country. And those are challenges that I guess all businesses have to face when they're looking for new markets because we're all looking for new markets, aren't we? And, and we should not close our mind to overseas. We have to understand that they operate differently. I can, uh, yeah, I mean, I I do have, I've come across that before. The other challenge I've had is currency fluctuations because we deal a lot in euros, uh, sometimes in dollars, and trying to predict where we are going. The dollar's gone up and down, you know, so much. The euro's not been so bad, but um, I'm that sort of person that listens to the uh, currency conversions by the hour um, because the radio stations (laughs) I listen to does, you know, on the news all the time talk about it. But I don't know, do you have any advice for, uh, you know, people like me that do rely on uh, a positive impact of of the currency for our profitability because I can see my profitability shrink depending on where the pound sits. You know, as the pound goes up, my conversion gets worse. So I don't know, do you have any any advice for people like me who maybe do have dealings in that respect? Yes, I mean, I I think you need to think about whether you need to hedge, I suppose, depending on um, the volume of transactions that, that you actually undertake. Um, and there is always that question around supply chain and whether it would be more cost efficient to look something somewhere else to yeah. source from, from somewhere else maybe. Um, but we are finding businesses certainly looking at their hedging strategy. So that, that 
that would be one point to to do and and the supply chain probably, i have tried it, probably if i don't don't leave it to you know if you're that concerned don't don't leave it to that market fluctuation because i need the money next mm. monday mm. you probably ought to think about booking it you know four months ago so that you actually crystallize uh, what you're going to have in your hand sure. on that on mm. that day so if it's there because you've got to to pay the rent or it's um you've got to pay your own customers um then you you know exactly what your in this instance euro is going to be worth next monday but you knew about it last november so yeah. there's there's ways of of easing that stress and planning but ahead of course, goes back, know, to back, planning. Yeah. back to planning and yeah and of course you know, as a, you know i accept that actually if you might have to accept a rate that you are less comfortable with but actually for for six months worth of peace of mind um why wouldn't you mm. it's about certainty isn't it it's yeah. it's like if you fix mm. your mortgage rate i suppose it's the same sort of concept isn't it it, it is it, you might be fixing it and maybe higher rate but at least you've got that certainty and, and comfort well I, I mean that's great i mean that's the situation i guess out there today and certainly you know from from my perspective okay so we've had the um the general view from the quarterly economic survey from David which which has given us I thought a, a broader view and uh, thank you Claire for giving us sort of how that impacts the Thames Valley um, great uh, great information there uh, perhaps uh, Carol you can give us uh, a broader view of from BDO of what it, what it looks like out there today yes yeah, sure um, so we are seeing a lot of the trends actually that have come out of the survey which is good it's definitely congruent information which is good so the, um, the, the survey's right then <laughs> yes as, as, as far as we can tell we are, we are certainly seeing similarities good um the staffing challenges are you know particularly still out there um it's very much i think about more than just wages um particularly for the i'm going to sound old now but for the younger generation where they are looking almost for cycles of experience through their career and they're not they're not necessarily looking to stick around for quite so long in their in their roles um it's about things like the environmental, social and governance agenda, for example, you know, are, are businesses ethical? Are they offering um, sort of good things on top of their um, sort of wage packets as well? So things like salary sacrifice um, is a, a thing that we're seeing quite a lot of. Um, you can do it for things like pensions, but actually um, for other areas as well, things like maybe electric cars, um, clearly very good good for the environment um i'm going to put my tax hat on now good benefit in kind only two percent of value at the moment um it is going up but it's at still the moment. at the moment but it, it is you know st still a kind of attractive benefit for um employees to have um so there, there's certainly something about businesses i think needing to think about what are they offering over and above just the the pure salary um how are they paying bonuses how are they deploying bonuses are they doing it in the right way um what do they do in terms of say increase in pay versus one-off payments as well um that that's a sort of big issue out there at the moment um and as claire alluded to things like um equity as well for example are you using share share plans share incentives sufficiently um there's also generally a, a war for talent out there that is not just a uk centric thing i think it's it's on an international basis and we're seeing businesses needing to actually be very flexible when they when they have a particular need for talent um, in an area they have to be very flexible about where they potentially look for that um, going international at times um, and also of course giving that real flexibility of where you work from as well and the hours that you that's work, quite topical at the moment isn't very it? topical very topical so you know do do you say to your employees i need you in the office three days a week um what will that do to your retention if your competitors saying well you can work where you want when you want so it, it's kind of it, it's an interesting dilemma I don't I don't think there is a right answer it's going to be very business specific but and um, there is something about how that flexible working is is embedding as well um, but that that kind of international piece we're seeing quite a lot of in smaller businesses um, the world is increasingly international so we are seeing um, smaller businesses actually have international issues that they need to manage and it's increasing the, the complexity um, which does take me on to tax which I have to talk about a little bit you've so been dying to I talk have, I sense you've been I dying have. to talk about this I'm a tax person I, I get excited about tax I, I know 
you guys want me to get it over with quickly. We've so recorded that. Can I just say that you get excited about? <laughs> I tax. know, I know. I should keep that to myself, really. Should, Otherwise, really. people will run away. But um, no, in terms of tax, um, definitely the international um, sort of expansion, I suppose, of, of businesses causes a lot of things to think about. Um, so, you know, if you have people working overseas, have you thought about your payroll taxes, your social security, corporate tax? Um, VAT customs, you know, if you're moving goods about. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that, that businesses do need to be cognizant about, um, which can take quite a lot of sort of investment to manage. Um, but if you, for example, wanted to exit in a few years' time, it could have, you know, value implications and um, cause you a lot of pain. So to actually monitor that and know, know where you are real time and plan is, is very sensible. Um, we've also had since the last quarterly update we had at the um, autumn statement as well which um, you know everyone will be relatively familiar with with the content um, but there, there were some particular changes around R&D tax credits which it's probably worth me just flagging um, small and medium businesses um, particularly in um, sort of R&D intensive sectors like life sciences for example which is a, a particular area of focus for me um, they're very reliant on um, the cash that they can get back from surrendering tax losses for um, cash, effectively, uh, as the, the tax losses that they get from their R&D credits. Um, and in the statement, it, the, the kind of benefit, the, the net benefit in the pound was pretty much halved for SMEs, sure. for, for small and medium enterprises. So um, they're... The, there is kind of this move towards aligning the small and medium credit with the larger company credit. Um, and that that came through in the statement with the larger credit being made more generous as well. Um, and there will be some consultation around helping very R&D intensive small and medium enterprises in terms of how, how they can... How they can um, sort of almost compensate for, for that lack of cash. But that that's something that um, I think is going to cause some challenges when, when that comes in. Um, the other point that we were perhaps expecting something on in the autumn statement was around capital gains tax, which there, there were some small changes, but the rate didn't change. And um, that, that's that been trailed for a while in terms of whether that, that will be amended. Um, and I, I do quite a lot of... Um, sort of M&A transactions, so se- selling businesses. Um, and if you, businesses were certainly gearing up for a change and usually it's trailed with, with a, a little bit of a lead time and then you'd get a flurry of activity potentially in terms of businesses wanting to get things over the line, which is, I, I guess, revenue raising for the government. But we didn't see that. It still might happen. We, we don't know, um, obviously, but it, it does seem likely that at some point that, that might change. Wow. I sense, Carol, if we gave you an hour, I sense that you could fill that hour. I probably could, but I won't. I'm done on tax. So. Well, um, <laughs> I've got a question for you, if I may. Yeah, and um, It's a question that I tend to talk about with my friends a fair bit, business sort of associates, and borrowing. What's your sort of feeling? Good time to borrow if we need it? Or um, two ways to look at it, I suppose, but I'd love to hear from, you know, the experts. Um, what do you do? Um if you need cash or you think you need cash? Oh, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I mean, if, if, you, if you're looking to sell your business at the moment, um, if that's how you're going to get cash, then it's probably, in some sectors, it's not a bad time. Yeah. Actually, there, there's a lot of private equity cash out there at the moment that needs a home. Um, and some sectors have actually remained very buoyant. Things like sort of life sciences and healthcare um, and tech, for example, um, they've remained reasonably you know, in, in good shape, um, despite the, the current position. So if you're looking to get cash that way, um, I think you you could explore selling your business. Um, in terms of actual borrowing, 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 borrowing um, oh, you need a crystal ball, don't you, on the interest rates, really? It's it's just, it, it's a horrendous question. I, I suppose that it goes back to what <laughs> Ted, you were talking about, Claire, isn't it? It's about the, the planning side, because if you've got, uh, a capital purchase that you need to uh, leverage from from a borrowing source. You, I guess, you need to closely work out what you can actually get from that asset in order to pay for this borrowing in the first place, isn't it? And it's often that sounds really simple, 
but that's 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 it in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's having that plan to demonstrate that you need cash, and then how are you going to utilize that cash to increase value ultimately? Um, because everyone's going to expect a return, even the banks expect a return through their interest rate. So it's it's demonstrating that need, but that affordability. So crystal ball then. <laughs> Pretty that's, much. That's I think. what we've come down to. Pretty okay. much. But yes, that, that certainty is that mortgage point again, really, isn't it? If you know, if if you want certainty, then I guess, you know, you could you can sort of lock in an interest rate, but as Claire said, you you need to know that you're gonna get sufficient value from that. So I guess it, it moves the goalposts a bit in terms of the cost benefit of doing certain things. That word planning is just ringing in my ears at the moment. So uh a lot, lot to do then, I think, in that perspective. And can I ask a question, actually? Because obviously, when I was doing all the these surveys in the last quarter, there was quite a... Because remember, a lot of the uh, members who are SME size, and a lot of them are thinking about employing their very first person. Have you got some, you know, from a taxation perspective, uh, Carol, what would you be telling them to think about that they should... As the, it sounds quite dull, isn't it? But actually, it's very important because actually it's about what should they be doing day one when this new recruit walks through the door? Their very first employee. It's quite an exciting time, you see, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Um, so they, they need to think about the package that they offer them, um, which we, we've touched on already. Um, they need to make sure they've got a payroll set up so that they can actually remit Social Security and um, PAYE to HMRC on a, on a sort of regular basis. Um, and there comes with that and with, with any benefits, various bits of sort of tax reporting as well that, that they need to do. Um, so they, they need to make sure they're geared up for that. And um, it's the sort of thing that they, they need to make scalable, obviously, if they're going to be having um, additional employees. So tell us a little bit about BDO. Who are they and, you know, what what do they do? Um, So we are a global um, accounting and advisory firm. Um, So we do everything that you could possibly want from an audit perspective, a tax perspective, um, transactions advisory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, We're now in the UK where I think at about 7,500 people. Um, So we've got people who could do everything you could possibly want um and um internationally we are now i think over a hundred thousand um people across the globe and we're in a hundred and sixty something countries so um we we pretty much can do anything that businesses need in that sort of financial accounting tax advisory space um and um we are a bunch of people that are very much encouraged to be ourselves as well so actually the culture at bdo is quite different I think to some other firms um we're all slightly quirky which has probably come out a little bit of of the the conversation today but that there we we are allowed to be ourselves and it's encouraged and I think that diversity of teams that you can get from that actually gives a really good um and better client experience as well Sure. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the space that you're in, some of the competitors that you may have, you know, what is it that you do differently? And if I could be so bold, maybe even, what is it you even do better than the competition? Oh, we do everything better. Of course we do. Um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that. No, um, we, I, I think it is about that real sort of focus on client service and getting that diversity of team. Because, you know, anyone can do a tax comp or, you know, a set of accounts or something. I say anyone, but, you know, yeah. anybody in, in the same sort of sector as us. Um, but it's about that real sort of difference of, of the people and building those relationships, getting to the, to the nub of what is important to our clients um, and being business advisors to help them plan, to help them think ahead, to share experiences. Um, and I think that actually makes us different and and quite powerful in the market yeah no I agree it's that client centricity piece and as as individuals not teaching but giving people that time to be curious ask the questions find out what's important to your clients and really getting to know your clients so they're at the heart of everything you do 
And that way we can provide a proactive service to our clients because if we understand them, what's important to them, what are their aspirations, we can then be spotting opportunities, advising them on the right things at the right time rather than being reactive to being asked, can you do this or can you help on this? Sure. I mean, that, that, that sounds great. Um, Claire, I'm going to ask you a, an interesting question, if I may, if you're ready for this. What do you enjoy the most about working at BDO? People. I am a huge people person, so both staff and clients. I like to call myself professionally curious, um, which is a polite way of saying I'm quite nosy. Um, I really like to get to know people I work with on a personal level as well as on on a corporate level, Um, understand what's important to them, what does home life look like, what do they do outside of, of work. And the same with clients, it's it's building those relationships, whether they be staff or clients, so that you can trust each other and you can have those open conversations. Because ultimately, without trust, you don't you know you don't have that advisor relationship. Sure, I, I, and that that sounds great. And um, if I can ask you, Carol, um, for those young recruits out there that are looking for a career, maybe they're really fascinated with tax as well. They could be. It's a and minority sport, but some are. Very mi- <laughs> minority, clearly. Um, but looking for their, their sort of future, looking for their career development, looking for a job, what could BDO, BDO be on their radar? Mm, I'd like to think so. I, I think we, we do get a lot of people interested in joining us um, because of the training programme um, and the fact that they, they do get the chance to become chartered accountants, chartered tax advisors. Um, so there, there's a piece around that, but actually... There's a lot more. I think that the experience that they'll get with us um, is is very much around, you know, building those relationships, getting wider skills beyond the technical, but also getting a real breadth of technical experience. Um, and I think as, as an advisor, the, the risk is actually about not, it's how do you identify what you don't know, if that makes sense. So it's, it's knowing how to tease out the questions that you need to ask and you know in tax I'm never going to know everything for example but I have to look at a problem and say okay what are the questions I need to answer and if you don't ask the question then you've missed something sure so it's kind of getting getting people equipped with those skills which kind of links to your point Claire about the curiosity and giving people time to to be curious um but it's it's exposing the trainees to that sort of culture and that sort of environment um, that will really challenge their thinking and give them that that ability to become sort of proper trusted business advisors. And that's almost a life skill as well when you it think is. about it. All of it that. Is. And I often think with companies that I've I've only ever worked for one company for my whole life before I started my own business and I joined as a seventeen year old boy, uh, still wet behind the ears and left as a father of two. Wow, a hugely different person than when I joined the business. And uh, I look back at my life and think, God, you know, I just didn't learn about the job. But actually, it's a great employer to learn about life. So, um, and I'm sure it's a great life. It sounds like a great life at BDO. Mm. No, it really is. It really is. It's, it's, um, it's hard to describe a culture. It's, ha- it's hard to sort of articulate what makes it different. But there is something. Mm. And, and it is different. And I think that that makes it a really nice place to, to come into. You don't get that Monday feeling. Great. Well, I look out, Tim. Maybe we look out for those recruitment ads. I'll be paged looking at them every day. We've got a lot to think about now, don't we, after that session? Uh, my thanks um, to the team from BDO there for uh, Claire and Carol. We've got lots of um, the words are resonating through my mind stability, sales, staff, cash flow, and investment. A lot to think about as we start 2023. For me, I think um, one of the pieces came out was communication. So when you come to our events, um, remember lots of like-minded souls are in that room. They want to hear and understand some of your own pains and some of your successes, I may add. It's not just about the pains. It is about all the good work that I know that you do um, because I talk to you every day. I have the best job in the world. So next month, I'm going to tap into our next uh, quarterly economic survey, the first one of the year. And please, I would ask you when we we send out the survey to you, please spend 
just a few minutes, because that's all you need to do is go through it and think about how your business is working so far for the year. And think about some of the things that uh, the team has said to you this morning. You will find in that particular edition, which is either a physical copy or in the news section on our website, the, the last few uh, last quarter's results. So think about how your customers are also reacting. But it just really means, remains for me to say is thank you for your participation in the survey. It means a lot to us and it means a lot to business. It is the biggest piece of work that uh, the Chamber undertakes every quarter. Um, I remember why you joined the Chamber is not only for excellent events and hopefully um, good contacts that you make, but also that, that small lobbying piece that we do um, on your behalfs for you each, each quarter. It just remains for me to say I will see you again in April when actually we'll probably return to a live face-to-face -face event. So it'd be really good if you could come up and tap me on the shoulder and say hi. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your attention. See you soon.